Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Crops TV. My name is Erin Hodson, and I'm an extension entomologist with Iowa State University. My episode today is talking about deck stem borer, another boring pest. Uh, I would like to give a special acknowledgement to Brian McCornack at Kansas State. He helped provide some content, photos, and video that I'm sharing today. I have to be honest and say that I, di I didn't know much about Dectes stem borer before 2023 when I started to hear about it in some of the western counties of the state. And so I relied on Brian and a few folks at the University of Nebraska to help me better understand how to identify this pest, learn more about its biology, how to successfully scout for adults and larvae, and then what are some management recommendations that I could make to farmers and crop consultants. Plus, I found out three fun facts about Dectes that I will share with you today. All right, we're going to take a step back and uh, talk about longhorn beetles in general. It's a very large family of insects with, with over 35,000 species worldwide. Um, as you can see by this fantastic photo, they're called longhorn beetles because the antennae are very long, usually as long or sometimes much longer than the entire length of their body. Also, for some longhorn beetles, they can have the antennal sockets low on the face. So normally you'd see the antennae coming out right before, right above the eyes, but in some cases they look like they're coming between the eyes or even low on the face. Okay, here's our first fun fact. Longhorn beetles squeak if pinched or disturbed. And lots of insects make noise if you think about like cicadas, crickets, and other things. Uh, but longhorn beetles do it by rubbing the joint between the first and second pair of legs on the belly side or the ventral side. And it's just known as a stridulation. And it, to me, it sounds like a little baby pig is squeaking. And yes, it is adorable. I think you should give it a try if you see a longhorn beetle like a milkweed or if you see Dectes this summer. Longhorn beetle larvae are also fairly unique. If you think about a Japanese beetle or other white grubs, they're always in a C shape and they're really distinctive. Uh, longhorn beetles are not that way. They're straight and almost accordion-like. And so the segments of the thorax and the abdomen are really distinct. Uh, they often have an enlarged and darkened head, but sometimes it looks like the mouth parts are being kind of sucked into the head, so it's retracted almost. Uh, almost all of the longhorn beetles feed in wood or other plants as larvae, and so they have very well-developed mandibles for bringing food into the mouth. And because they live in plants, oftentimes their legs are reduced or even absent. Okay, getting more specific with Dectes stem borer, the adults from top to bottom, just the body, is around three eighths to three quarters inches. Uh, they belong to a subfamily known as flat-faced longhorn beetles. So if you're looking straight on, perhaps with a microscope or a hand lens, it kind of looks like their face is very flat compared to other longhorn beetles. They have a somewhat slender shape or an elongated body. I think the whole body looks like it's gray or covered in a little fuzz. Uh, even their legs have fuzz on them. And as the common name would suggest, uh, the family of flat-faced longhorn beetles, they have very long antennae. You'll notice here in this photo that they're banded, light and dark. That is a characteristic that can help you distinguish from other longhorn beetles. They have a very rectangular head, and if you notice, the head just looks like it attaches to that first pair of legs, that segment. There's no neck or any point of constriction. It just looks kind of like a broad triangle. And I think uh, Dectes have relatively big thighs or big femurs uh, through all three pairs of legs. Um, they must be doing a lot of squats or something, I'm not sure, but they look pretty beefy compared to the rest of the leg. Okay, I don't think that you would mistake Dectes adults for other insects and field crops, especially in Iowa. Perhaps the only one that you might mistake it for is the ash gray blister beetle. Similar size, shape, and kind of a gray fuzzy uh, coating all over the body. But there's two things that'll give it away. First of all, 
With deck knees, of course, you're gonna see very long, light and dark banded antennae that extend past the body. And if you happen to listen to my Crops TV episode on blister beetles, you'll know that blister beetles have a pretty diagnostic constriction between the head and the first pair of legs. So it almost looks like they have a neck. So you'd be able to use these two characters to distinguish them because you could find them out and about around the same time in the growing season. Uh, I don't think that you would mistake Dectes larvae for anything else that you might see in soybean. Most of the caterpillars that we see are brightly colored green, maybe yellow or some other colors. Sometimes they have lots of spines and anywhere from two to four pairs of prolegs on the abdomen. Dectes larvae are about a half an inch or uh, maybe up to five eighths inch in length when fully developed. The first instars start off light or white, and they turn uh, dark yellow as they mature. They're very slender and have an elongate accordion shape. And like all longhorn beetles, they sort of have this enlarged, darkened head. And in the case of Dectes, uh, the larvae are legless. Like all beetles, Dectes has a complete life cycle with four distinct life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And other big groups of insects that have this type of metamorphosis include moths and butterflies, flies, lacewings, and wasps. So this would be different than another common type of metamorphosis called simple, in which you have three distinct life stages, egg, nymph, adult. You would find uh, this type of metamorphosis in grasshoppers, all the true bugs, aphids, and earwigs. Now, Dectes is going to have a typical one generation per year. So I think about their emergence or their phenology that we would see in the fields in this graphic right here. Most of the life stages you're not going to see unless you're picking apart stems, but the adults become active and are flying around to find food, mates, and places to lay eggs uh, starting at the end of June. And mainly the peak is around July and then a few more emerging in August. The literature suggests that the adult peak emergence is around 1400 to 2000 degree days with like the sharpest peak around 1500 degree days. So remember, um, it, in central Iowa, this is probably around the second or third week of July that you'd have peak emergence. But in cool springs and summers, that would be pushed back a little bit in the month. If you had a really warm spring and summer, that peak might happen earlier in July. Uh, the adults are going to mate. They need pollen to eat, and females need pollen for food. And she is going to start laying eggs about two weeks after emergence. So the egg laying period is going to be at the at the back end of July and then throughout August. Now, as I mentioned, the adults need to eat pollen, uh, and the males and females strongly prefer to feed on the pollen that comes from commercial sunflower. Uh, now in Nebraska. South Dakota, Kansas, there is a little bit more of that commercial production. But in Iowa, we typically don't see that much sunflower. So they decided that soybeans and weeds are okay to eat too. So you will find them on soybean, also feeding on ragweed, cockleburr, and wild sunflower. Now, the uh, larvae are the life stage that's economically important. A female will chew a hole near the petiole of a lateral stem and uh, make her way into depositing a single egg. The egg will hatch into a larva, and that larva is going to make its way down. So from the petiole down to the base of the stem by feeding on the pith. And so, of course, they're going to get larger as they go from first in star to near, near pupation. Uh, and eventually, that feeding, they're kind of scraping away that pith with their strong mandibles, can girdle and sometimes even cleave the stem, causing plant death or lodging. So oftentimes, you'll see if you're splitting open a stem, it'll be full of frass. It almost looks like sawdust as they're scraping away the pith. And at certain points of the year, you would be able to see larvae inside as well. I should say this video is in really fast forward. It takes a long time for them to get to a pet from a petiole to the base of the stem. 
All right, fun fact number two about Dectes, they kind of live like Thunderdome, two enter and one leave. You could have multiple eggs being deposited within a stem, but they will fight to the death. And usually by the end of the growing season, as it makes its way down and preparing for overwintering, only one larva is going to survive. And so you may split stems open in July and August and see multiple larvae. But um, by the time temperatures get colder, day length shortens, there will only be one survivor. Okay, so I got a lot of questions about scouting for Dectes stem board last summer. And so I wanted to share some tips for adults and larvae. It's good to know that adults are weak flyers. They only really move as far as they need to, to find food and find mates and places to lay eggs. Uh, so it's usually within a field or between fields. Uh, it's a slow uh, distance that they would be moving within a, a growing season. And so again, they strongly prefer to feed on sunflower, but if that's not there, they're gonna be found within and around soybean. And because they don't move very far, uh, unless they're searching for food or mates, they're definitely another edge effect insect. And so they're gonna be found around the perimeter first, and then eventually over time, they could make their way to the field interior. So I prepared this little graphic. It's a very simplified uh, version of uh, fields that were infested last year in soybean shown in green with a corn field planted in between. So if this was 2023 and you had noticed that you had Dectes in your soybean fields, likely those fields will be rotated to corn this year. And so my recommendation is to sample the soybean at the dark areas first, so sample around the perimeter. If you're not finding Dectes adults around the perimeter, I wouldn't bother uh, wasting time sampling in the field interior. You're very unlikely to find them. But if you did find Dectes along one edge or maybe a couple edges, I would continue sampling and uh, looking for Dectes because this is going to be really important when we get to the management considerations. So my recommendation would be to start sampling after the peak. So you'd be watching for degree days uh, at 1500. Once you hit that important benchmark, you can use a sweep net to capture the adults. Uh, they're highly mobile as far as within plants, between plants during the day. And so if you're using a sweep net and you are uh, starting at the edge and you're starting uh, near last year's soybean fields, you would be able to collect them with the sweep net if you're hitting the top half of the canopy. Now, a little bit later in the season, if you're trying to get an estimate of how many plants are infested, you would do this a little bit later because remember the female takes a little bit of time to start laying eggs and then for the eggs to hatch into larvae. So I would be looking for infested plants in August and maybe even into early September. So remember, she chews a little hole to deposit her eggs, and eventually that hole is going to become discolored and it looks sort of like an orange-red scar or pit near the petiole. A few weeks after that egg hatches into a larva, you're going to notice that the lateral stem becomes discolored, it kind of looks shriveled up, and eventually it's going to die. And so again, I would look for infested plants by having that surge image of the petiole scar at the edge and then going to the field interior if you're finding infested plants around the perimeter. And now there's lots of reasons why uh, plants can look discolored or wilted or like a rapid wilt, and it's not always because of Dectes stem borer. So you'd want to confirm the larvae in the stems. And you could do this in August, but more likely you'll have success in September all the way up until harvest. So if you're pulling a plant that you suspect has Dectes, use a little pocket knife to pry the stem open and look for larvae, look for frass, and look for sawdust. And be sure that you're, be, you're able to distinguish the frass that is created by the Dectes uh, from brown stem rot and maybe other pathogens that could be in the pith or the center of the stem. So remember, you're going to see that from the petiole down. It's working its way down to right above that soil line over the summertime. All right, again, there's lots of reasons why uh, you can have laterals or plants look wilted or discolored. So if you have a plant that's shown here that is infested with Dectes, the lateral breaks off from the main stem very easily. And you're going to see frass, kind of sawdust and discoloration right at the point at, at which the larvae is making its way down into the stem. 
this is a really easy way to distinguish between uh, maybe brown stem rot and other things is that the laterals break off. And then if you split the stem open, you should see a larva or maybe a couple larvae inside the stem working its way down. Okay, and you can scout right now. I'm recording this video, it's the middle of January, and depending on how much snow you have, uh, you would be able to walk out to a field and look at stubble and see clean cuts. That's your first visual cue. Um, so instead of a rough cut made with mechanical injury caused by like a combine, uh, Dectes is going to use their mandibles to make a clean cut and you will always see a little frass plug or it kind of looks like um, kind of dried up grass that's plugging the end of the stubble to help uh, improve the likelihood of overwintering. So uh, we did a, a presentation similar to this for ICM conference in December and Brian brought up plants from an infested field in December pulled them that, uh, you know, the day before, and we were able to successfully dissect those stems, and it was easy to see the frass and the larvae. So you could do this sampling method for confirmation all the way up until planting. And so if it is too snowy right now, you could go back out in the spring to see if you had Dectes uh, trying to overwinter in those fields. All right, so management considerations. This is my last segment here. Uh, the y potential yield loss from Dectes is all over the board. And the reasons why you can have yield losses is somewhat um, murky, um, but uh, what what I could gather from states that have had persistent Dectes problems is, on average, you could have about 15% yield losses in heavily infested fields. So this is not this is these are not fields that are just have a few Dectes around the perimeter. These are fields that have more uniform infestations throughout the field. And uh, the reasons why you could have a yield loss, you'd think that feeding in the pith would be a main reason, but it's really inconsistent. So generally, the the yield losses come from plants that get cleaved or um, they break off at the base and they drop to the ground and combines don't pick up those pods or those beans and that's where the yield loss comes from. So when I think about all the potential integrated pest management or IPM strategies used for field crops, you have these really big buckets or really big uh, toolboxes to use. Uh, there are many, many things that are within a farmer control to influence, so either help or hinder the success of a field crop pest. These are things like planting date, row spacing, plant population, and weed control. There are some things that are a little bit less out of a farmer's control that include breeding efforts. Um, so they would certainly would be able to select those genetics, but uh, it's really the breeders that try and get tolerance or resistance or repellency uh, of that uh, genetics from that key, key target pest. And so that works successfully for better, better than others um, for some key pests. Of course, I'm sure you are all familiar with transgenics that are different forms or different tactics um, to kill or suppress pests like BT or RNA that works very successfully for some pests. And then there are certain situations where biological control with natural enemies does a really great job with predators, pathogens, and parasitoids. But generally, the first go-to tool that a farmer might use for field crop pests is chemical control in the form of insecticidal seed treatments, in furrow applications, or foliar applications later on in the season. So I'm just going to review uh, some of these big tactics or strategies when it comes to Dectes. So uh, for cultural control, largely what uh, folks are doing when they have very persistent populations of Dectes is incorporate fall tillage. And this is right after harvest, and they're making sure that they are burying the residue at least three inches deep. Now, burying this uh, interrupts the success of Dectes that are trying to overwinter, and you can have a dramatic reduction in the spring populations or the, the summertime adult emergence. Uh, when you do this fall tillage. You may or may not want to do fall tillage for other reasons on the farm, but for those that have had real problems, it does seem like fall tillage is an effective option. Uh, most of the literature from southern states and, and states to the west of us talk about crop rotation. The more diverse a landscape is on a farm, the harder it is for Dectes to find suitable hosts to lay eggs. 
So uh, in some areas of the United States, they really do have a more diverse cropping system. But for Iowa, um, you know, we have two, maybe three crops. And so this makes it really easy for a pest like Dectes to bounce around and find soybean from year to year because it's readily available. So I'm not sure um, about this tactic unless you were willing to incorporate some more diversity on the farm. Almost every extension and research article that I read in preparation for this talked about incorporating narrow row spacing of seven to 15 inches. And it's not that the population or the canopy or anything affects the infestation rate from Dectes, but uh, the narrow row spacing uh, does help affected plants that are broken off at the base be held up by their neighboring plants with hopes that they can, uh, if they've reached full seed set, they would be able to be picked up by a combine if they're held uh, by some of their neighbors. And so this is where scouting really is important. If you're noticing maybe a part of the field, like an edge of the field is infested, or if you do have a uniform infestation, is to put those areas or those fields higher up in the queue, they get harvested first. And so you're minimizing the loss that comes with lodging and plants falling to the ground. And so that's a strategy that's used for a number of uh, pathogens and insects is to harvest those areas first and, and don't wait until uh, November to get those uh, plants out of the ground. Uh, I found some really inconsistent information about planting date. And so my recommendation at this time is to not change your planting date or your client's planting dates based on trying to confuse Dectes. I would plant when it's good to plant, you have vigorous growth and hopefully it can outgrow Dectes and other field crop pests. Uh, another important cultural control uh, option is weed control within and around fields. And there's Lots of reasons why we want to minimize weeds within fields, but to know that plants that we consider weeds that produce pollen are really attractive to not only Dectes, but corn rootworm, lots of other insects that like to eat pollen. So remember, this is the main food source for adults. And so if you can minimize that, it's going to uh, lessen the attraction for them to move into a field and to lay eggs. I'm not sure um, how feasible this is for Iowa, maybe more uh, applicable to states west of us where they use center pivot irrigation, but there's some nice research projects that show that the primary area of the field can be preserved if you're planting a trap crop with sunflower in the corners. So remember that's their preferred host. And so if you can attract Dectes, and once you reach that peak adult emergence is to cut it and bury the residue very deeply. And this minimizes the infestation rates in the primary part of those uh, pivot fields. Again, I'm not sure if this is really feasible in Iowa. I don't see too many of these um, going on, but yeah, the, the thought about using a trap crop, maybe in a different way for Iowa, is something that I just haven't seen, but I'm certainly interested to explore. When it comes to soybean genetics, unfortunately, host plant resistance for Dectes does not exist. I know of a few research labs that are looking at transgenics, specifically RNAi, to uh, reduce or suppress Dectes. And so far, it's, it's looking pretty successful, but I don't think that we would see uh, this transgenics commercially available for a number of years. Uh, maybe a little bit more in a farmer's hands is, is a strong consideration while looking at seed catalogs is to look at increased maturity groups so that you would have delayed flowering, delayed senescence, and this has been shown or proven effective for reducing the number of lodged plants in the field. So if that is an option for you is to plant when it is good to plant, but just use uh, an increased maturity group, it may help um, keep more plants standing at the end of the season. And uh, I, did, I thought it was important to point out that Dectes larvae cannot cleave or cut stems that are greater than half an inch. And so this is something that comes from experience with agronomists and farmers is to select soybean genetics that have larger stems. And there are some uh, 
other ways that you can control, like how big a, a soybean stem might get. Um, but I think you might have a sense of certain genetics that just have bigger main stems. And that's going to minimize the chance, again, of that you would have the clipping or cutting right above the soil line. Even if you did have decades feeding within the PIF, you may not see the yield reductions that comes because the plants are standing when it comes to harvest. And then finally, chemical control considerations. I don't think it's hard to kill a Dectes stem borer adult. If you have a pyrethroid, which is probably the most common insecticide we're using in soybean, if you have droplets that make contact with Dectes, I think it's very likely to work. But they do have an extended adult emergence period. Remember, um, it could be uh, two to six weeks that you're having new adults coming out. The peak is around 1500 degree days. And so if you're able to track that uh, locally on the farm, you'd want to target and a spray around that peak. Some have also found a, a big drop in number of infested plants if they use a second application 10 days after the peak. However, the return on investment is all over the place. And so my general recommendation is not to use uh, an insecticide for adult control because um, you're, it is very, um, you're on the fence of whether you're going to make uh, a break even or even a profitable application because infestations don't necessarily lead to yield losses. It is generally more that the plants are lodged and dropping on the ground. And so again, the timely harvest is going to be your most effective method and not an not um, investing in inputs of, of insecticides when you don't know if you're going to break even or make a profit. And of course, all of the insecticides that we uh, prefer to use in soybean uh, would not be systemic when applied as a foliar application. And so they're not going to contact or reduce um, the livelihood of uh, the Dectes lar larvae. So they're, uh, that that's not an effective strategy. And the adults is just a really hard um, thing to time and do a good job. So my last fun fact here is that, yes, you can have Dectes stem borer and soybean gall midge in the same field in the same plant. Um, Dectes makes its way down and uh, soybean gall midge it really concentrate, concentrates its feeding at the base of the plant. And so uh, if you keep track with soybean gall midge over the last couple of years, we've uh, increased the number of, of infested counties in Iowa last year. Uh, with the region here, the seven state region, we have 164 counties confirmed and about half of the state, half of the counties in Iowa. Uh, and if you look at this area that's infested here in this map, you'll see it's a lot of overlap of where I would expect to find Dectes. And so you have a couple of boring pests feeding at the same time, again, sometimes in the same field. And so this really is uh, causing management issues for both pests because they have similar problems uh, that make it very difficult to control. So yes, it's another boring pest. And so I created this table here just to kind of compare and contrast. I think that soybean gall midge is probably native to North America, and we'll probably find that out in the next couple of years. But yes, Dectes is native to North America. I would consider the adults of both species to be weak flyers. They move within and between fields, but their uh, long distance movement just isn't there. Both of the larvae feed inside the stems. Both of the larvae would overwinter in soybean fields. Dectes is overwintering in the stubble. Soybean gall midge is overwintering below the soil. Uh, soybean gall midge has around two to three overlapping generations per year, while Dectes just has one generation. And I would consider both of these initially as perimeter edge pests problems. You can have the, both of these pests move into the field interior, but most likely you're going to see problems along the edge first. All right, so just some final takeaways here uh, for Dectes stem borer management. Crop rotation is the key, although I don't know too many people that are doing continuous soybean or two or more years of soybean, but you definitely wanna mix it up as much as possible and consider even further diversifying the crops on the farmer and the, and the landscape to minimize the attractiveness and the ease of moving back and forth between soybean between growing season. I definitely recommend using narrow row spacing to prop up those infested plants so that they don't get um, missed with the combine by falling over and falling on the ground. 
I highly recommend scouting fields starting at the edges in late July and early September to help direct your harvest plan. And harvesting those infested areas or those fields first can really help minimize any yield losses that you might expect with Dectes. So again, I'd like to thank Brian McCornack for all his help with um, teaching me about Dectes. It's a new pest for me, and I really appreciate you watching this episode of Crops TV. Thank you. Mm -hmm.